Hello. So welcome to my latest webinar, Creating a Buzz About Health. So I'm Paula Carnell, and today I'm going to be talking about bees, one of my great passions. So if you're looking at this on Facebook, then please share it. You go to the, the link below and just say share and you can tag your friends if you want them to, to watch. And if you're on YouTube, you can also comment. And when you comment, I will be able to see the comments and I will answer questions at the end of the webinar. So I'm talking about creating a buzz about health and the connection between bee and human health. So that is a great passion of mine. So what I want to do is let you know, if you are interested in knowing, what bees are spending most of their time doing. A lot of people think that bees just buzz around and perhaps visit some flowers, but it might interest you when I share what they're actually spending most of their time doing. I'm also going to talk about bees and their favourite food. So is it honey? Is it nectar? Is it pollen? And where do they prefer to get their nectar and pollen from? And then I'm going to share some really interesting stories about sociable bees and unsociable bees. And this is some really interesting research that I learned about last year at Apimondia. But I've also found there's been quite a lot of studies about how sociable bees are. And are they as sociable as we are with our social media? And then I'm going to talk about fertility amongst bees and why it isn't what it once was. So if you're interested in um, bees and the loving that they have and how they're reproducing and what's happening in the bee world, then I'm going to talk about that as well. And then the things that we can do to try and help help the bees be a bit more fertile. So and then I'm going to end with a bit of more about should we be keeping bees? So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So if you're thinking about keeping bees and you don't know whether it is a good or a bad thing, then wait till the end and I will talk about that and discuss the pros and cons about keeping bees. And then I'm going to talk about the momentum for change. So how beekeeping is really changing quite rapidly over the last um it's been a gradual change over the last few years, but this last year, it's just sped up. And so many people all around the world are changing the way that they're keeping bees. So you're probably interested to know, what do I know about bees? You know, who am I? Who am I to even talk about bees? So I'm going to share a bit about my story. So I'm Paula Carnell. I live in Somerset in the UK. And I started beekeeping about nine years ago. And then I was actually bed and wheelchair bound with a genetic condition called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So I certainly would not have been as active as I am now. And I wasn't able to keep the bees on my own. I had a mentor. So I learnt from one-to-one -one tuition from an amazing man called Chris, who taught me a lot about what I know now about bees. But I was also a bit of a difficult um, student for him because I'd been learning about my own condition and how to heal my own body. And I wasn't following the conventional path. So I went along the whole path of um, natural medicine, herbal medicine, nutrition, diet, meditation. And so I learned a lot about how my body works and how to get it healthy. So it was natural then that when I came to be having bees, I just wanted to find out what the similarities were. And when I was learning about the things that were making the bees sick, that was when I started to draw parallels. And I was asking questions about why we were doing certain things in bee beekeeping and how there might be another way. So that was my, my initial start with beekeeping. So now I work as a consultant. I travel around the world. I work, or I did travel around the world, um, and I work with honey producers. I work with beekeepers. I work with visitor attractions, hotels, anywhere where they're having bees and they want to do it a bit differently. So people that are interested more in the preservation of bees and educating their visitors. So I love to go into somewhere where they've got visitors coming and they want to have bees. They perhaps want to have their own honey and they want to do it in a sustainable way. 
And so that's what I've been really understanding and researching is how we can keep bees in a sustainable way and how I can help businesses, individuals do that in a sustainable way. I do believe that we are connected with nature. And so I do think it's good to take some honey, but the priority is that the bees always have the honey for themselves first. So that is my, my biggest priority. So if you're watching and you've got any questions throughout, just type them in the comments and at the end, I will answer them or do my best to answer them. So one of the great facts about um, bees is that every decision they make is for the good of the whole colony. And that's very different to humans because every decision that a human makes is for the good of the individual. And that's a key difference between bees and humans. And a lot of beekeeping has been as evolved and based on human values and not on bee values. And it's only through observing bees and really spending time watching them that we can understand more about what goes on inside the hive and therefore how different they are to humans and actually what we can learn from bees rather than bees needing to learn from us. I mean, bees have been around a lot longer than us, so they've been around 150 million years. So they've had plenty of time to evolve and practice and just try out what works and what doesn't work. Whereas humans, we've only been around six million years and only really living in communities and evolving in the last 200,000 years. So we really are the new kids on the planet. So it seems extraordinary that we should be projecting what we feel is best on the bees. And that's what's so exciting about the natural beekeeping movement is that it's all about learning from the bees. It's about watching the bees and understanding what they do already. How do they solve their problems? But in recent years, the bees have been really suffering and we've seen massive losses all around the world. There doesn't seem to be one thing that is killing them off. We can't seem to put our finger on the, the magic pill that will either heal all the bees or stop them being sick or stop the losses. And so this is what I'm really interested in, is picking apart all the different problems that bees have by observing bees in different types of hives, different locations, different countries. We can learn how different communities um, and quite often traditional beekeeping, ancient beekeeping, indigenous peoples beekeeping, have methods that work more in alignment with nature, which is very different to the sort of industrial um, exploitation in some ways of, of keeping bees and for the purpose of honey. So although I love honey and I'm all for having a business and, and having bees to actually help areas around the world that need to um, solve poverty issues, keeping bees is a really great sustainable business if it's done right and it does help people and it helps the environment for instance in madagascar the beekeepers there are the guardians of the trees so by supporting madagascan beekeepers um, you're buying their honey and by buying their honey that gives them money that then allows them to plant more trees and they protect their trees because they know that the bees need the trees to feed from so it's looking at the whole um, environment around bees. It's looking at the impact bees have in our environment and how we can be part of that. So what I want to do is, is really try and find a way that humans can live alongside bees, because if we do lose the bees, we really are going to struggle. So this is quite interesting. And I actually put this in one of the versions of my book, A to Bees, Artist to Bees. And this was an embroidery that I did when I must have been about five or six years old. And it's busy as a bee. And I'm not a great um, seamstress. So there's not much that can, there's not many pieces of embroidery that you can find that I've done. But this sort of reappeared after rummaging around and having a sort out a couple of years ago. And I just thought it was amazing that then I had done this or been attracted to the whole thought of bees and I actually had a school summer dress with a little bee um, embroidery on it as well so bees have always been a little bit in the background of my life and since I've recovered from my illness and I've been working as a as a bee lady and working as a beekeeper as a consultant running courses teaching people making skeps just having a very busy life 
people are often saying, oh, you're busy as a bee now, which fits. So I found it really interesting when I discovered this little bit of research that was saying that actually bees do not spend the majority of their time being busy. And this really shook me. It completely shook me to the core because we all think of busy as a bee. And when we see bees, they are busy. They're flying backwards and forwards from their hive to the plants, collecting nectar, collecting pollen. And they are full on busy, busy bees. But what we don't really think about is what are they doing inside the hive? And researchers found that they put little cameras inside hives and they were observing the life cycle of the bees. And there's been many scientists, including um, Tom Seeley in America from um, just north of, of New York. And he's been studying bees since the 1970s, both in the wild and in hives. And there's been these studies that look at the whole life cycle, how bees communicate with each other and what they actually spend all their time doing when we're not watching them. Because only about half the colony are flying. The rest of the bees are actually inside. So what are they doing and what do bees do when they come back with their nectar and pollen? So we're thinking of them being busy, busy, busy and so much to do. And they have to collect this nectar. They have to collect the pollen. They've got to feed the larvae. There is a lot to do. But within a hive, you're going to have about 50,000 bees. So that's quite a large colony and they don't all need to be busy at once. And this is what the studies found is that bees spend the majority of their time resting. Now, this completely blew my mind because I was thinking we all have to be busy all the time. There's always something to do as a wife, as a mother, you know, running a business you're always busy, there's always something to do. And it's very difficult to find time to sit and do nothing. And I had seven years where I basically sat and did nothing or I lay down and did nothing. And I spent a lot of time resting. And when you look at the bees, this is what they know, that when you're resting, the body can heal. It cannot heal when you're busy. And so bees manage their time by spending as much as possible just resting inside the hive so that when they have an emergency, when there's a big nectar flow, when there's suddenly all the lavender is out and the nectar's rising, or they need a lot of pollen to feed the new brood, then they'll all take off and they'll all be busy. Or if the hive collapses or if they need to make new wax, then they're busy and they've got the energy resources. So we can learn so much about bees because how often do we take time to rest? And how often do we sleep really well? Do we really ensure that we're having a proper deep rest that allows our body to heal? There are many people who suggested that I was ill because I'd got to 40 and I hadn't rested properly until that point. And with conventional medicine, they justified it by saying I actually had a genetic condition and it was amazing. I was still as active as I was by the time I was 40. But nobody expected me to get better. And that's what's really interesting is that by spending the seven years really nurturing my body, really understanding my body and really nourishing it, then I was able to heal. Our bodies want to be in a well state. And this is a key thing that we have to understand about bees is they want to be healthy. They want to be well. They don't want to be sick. Nobody really wants to be sick, but we can't say that bees are going to be supported or, you know, they've got no motivation to work. They want to work. They want to help the whole colony. They want the colony to survive and be strong. So they want to be working. So inside the hive, you do have these issues of what the bees are doing and what is affecting them. What is it that is actually stopping bees being so active? And in the research where they showed that the bees were resting most of the time, they actually compared it with colonies that were not so protected. So colonies that were in a more conventional or even industrial husbandry sort of situation. So the hives were being moved for pollination. They were being um, it, having the honey extracted. They were being opened every week and inspected. So it was quite an intensive form of beekeeping. Also, those bees were being exposed to pesticides. Now, it's quite commonly known now that the neonics were damaging bees, but it took researchers over 20 years to prove it. 
And this is what's so worrying, is that these chemicals can be used on crops, either systemic chemicals or spraying, and then it has to be proven that they're not safe for insects before they get withdrawn. And this is what's been happening for years. Scientists have been trying to find the proof that the neonics in particular, the neonicotinoid pesticides, um, which are systemic, so they're inside a seed and they make the whole plant toxic. They've been trying to prove how dangerous these were. And what I found was that there was some research done at Imperial College in London, and they were studying bumblebees. And they found that after bumblebees were exposed to neonicotinoids, they would be really, really hyperactive before they would completely crash out. They also then found that worker bees were only living three quarters as long as normal bees, bees that weren't exposed. One of the neonicotinoids, clothianonidin, <laughs> clothianonidin, it impairs the natural immune system. And the bees rely on social immunity. So what this means is that it's not the individual. We tend to think of bees as being individuals like humans, but they're not. They work as a community. And so when they have sick or dead bees, they have to clear them out of the nest. They found that exposure to clothianonidin, it reduced the hygienic behavior. So the bees became less able, less motivated to actually clean out or groom themselves. In Canada, Toronto University, as well as Dave Goulson in Sussex in the Britain, they were studying fungicides and they found that the fungicides make the neonicotinoids more toxic. So in the Canadian study, they found that it only took half as much as the chemicals in neonics to kill bees if they had the fungicides added. So when these chemicals are tested, they'll be testing individual chemicals, but actually in the field when they're used, they have the fungicides added. And so they found that this was making the, the whole insecticide more damaging. They also found that hives that had been affected or exposed to these chemicals, they lost their queen and they often failed to produce a new one. And this is something that I've found a lot this year which has really shocked me and made me change some of my beekeeping practices because I realise now we really are in a, in a critical situation where we need to try and protect the bees. So insecticide manufacturers, they've been blaming Varroa mite for the main losses of bees. However, there's a really well-known um, beekeeper in America called Brett Addy, who, was a or who is a commercial beekeeper. And in 2015, he said that colony losses were five to eight percent um, for the 15 years that he'd been struggling with Varroa. So they'd only lost five to eight percent of bees for the 15 years that they were struggling with Varroa. But once neonicotinoids were introduced, the losses have risen up to 50 percent. And they've just released the figures for 2020, which show the highest overall losses April 19, 2019 to April 2020, the US beekeepers lost an average of 43.7% of their colonies. That's the second highest ever colony loss level reported. Now, normally colonies are lost over the winter and you would expect a certain amount of, of colony loss. And this is what I find interesting about traveling around the world is different countries have different expectations of what a colony loss should be. Um, in Bhutan, it will be just if a bear or a tiger has taken a hive. So they're talking less than 1%. Um, here in the UK, it could be 5 to 8%. That's meant to be fairly normal and acceptable. But when bees have been used for pollination and extreme pollination, those figures really rise. Now, what's really worrying is that the summer losses are growing. And this is what I'm noticing here in Somerset, is that the swarms are failing to, to requeen, they're failing to, the queens are failing to mate. And um, Oregon State University has just published a study showing that the, um, the summer losses are the highest ever. 32% of colonies in the USA were lost in 2019 in the summer. So this has to be a direct re response to the exposure that they've got of the pollen and the nectar they're taking. So they also found that the exposure to neonicotinoids, it really severely shortens the lifespan of bees. And this is what they were doing when they were studying the inside of hives. 
they found that the healthy bees, they have this um, system that they work through before they go out and fly. So the bees would start off um, once they hatch, they'll be cleaning bees and they might spend three days doing that. Then they might spend a day and a half being a nurse bee or three days and then they'll go off and feed other other bees and they'll be doing all the different jobs before they're about two and a half, three weeks old and their wing muscles are strong enough, strong enough and then they can go into the foraging. Now, what they found was that the hives that were exposed and highly managed, the colonies were dying out quicker. The lifespan of the individual bees was not as long. So instead of having five to six weeks, the bees were dying three to four weeks. And this is a really, really big problem. So it means that the bees were only spending a day and a half cleaning instead of three days. They were flying before they were fully mature. But the key thing was they weren't resting. They were spending no time resting. So we can learn a lot about that because if you're not able to rest, your body can't heal. Now, the way that insecticides work is they affect the nerve receptors. So in our cells, we have receptors all around the cells and you have a nerve impulse that will come into the receptor. The receptor then will receive that impulse and it will close and take the impulse around the body and act on it. Now, when you've been affected by insecticides, these receptors don't close, which means that they're constantly being bombarded with new nerve impulses. And this is what stops the bees from resting. My question is, what happens to us if we are being exposed to these pesticides and insecticides? Bearing in mind that the highest use of these chemicals is on our food. So what is that actually doing for us? So, so let me go back. So the next thing to think about is what is the bee's favourite food? Now, we all have gardens with beautiful flowers on, exotic flowers, and we get so excited when we see the bees on our lavender or on our crocosmia. Um, but the Welsh Botanic Gardens, they were very interested because they had over 8,000 species of plants in, in their gardens and they wanted to know what it was that the bees were really interested in. What was it that the bees were choosing to go to when they had such a wide choice of plants? What was it they were going to to create their honey? Now the results were quite shocking. They found that they were 11 native species of plants that the bees were choosing. So the honey was mainly made up from clover, brambles, dandelion, willow, just all the things that we think of as weeds. And that's what the bees were going to. So that really has quite an impact on the survival of bees. Because why is it that even when they're given such a wide choice of beautiful flowers and amazing exotic plants, why were they leaving the botanic gardens and going to the woodlands and the hedgerows surrounding them to go for the weeds? What is it? So I believe, and as well as Jacqueline Freeman in her book, Song of Increase, that the bees know where the minerals are. They know where the best nutrition is. So what they know is that if a seed has been sown wildly, then it's gone there for a purpose. It's, it's there to heal the soil that it's, it's sown in. And so it's bringing up the right vitamins and minerals, the right nutrition. And the bees need a wonderful variety of food to eat from. So that's what they're looking for. So maybe that's why they're going for the weeds, because the weeds are in the places they need to be. People don't plant blackberries very rarely where they where they want them. They just appear. And the same with dandelions. And over time, you'll see the dandelions move. You'll see the clover move. You might have a field full of clover for a few years. And then the next year, there's no clover. So it's moving along. It's shifting. And the bees seem to know that. So what does that say about us planting trees, planting plants, planting flowers? How is that going to have an impact on the bees and their nutrition? They've also found that inside the hive through the winter months, the bees don't just start at one side and work their way across. They actually self-medicate. They move around the hive, choosing a variety of, of different products. So this links in to feeding sugar to bees. And this was one of the first alarm bells that I had with bees. And it's always been a real um, contentious issue because 
if we don't feed bees, there's a worry that they'll die. But you have to think, why are you having to feed them? Are they not taking enough honey or are we taking too much honey? So what I try and do is always ensure that the bees have enough of their own honey. And how much is enough? It's impossible to say because our climate is changing. The weather patterns will affect how the bees will have access to different plants. If it's wet, the bees can't fly. If it's cold and in the depths of winter, then the bees don't need to fly and they will stay in a state of torpor and they don't need to eat so much. But if we have a long, mild, wet winter, the bees won't be in a state of torpor and they won't be able to fly either. So they need to eat their food resources. If we have a mild, warm winter that's dry, the bees will think, oh, it's spring and I'll fly. But they could be flying around and there's no food for them. So we need to be thinking about what we're doing with our hedgerows, how our plants are evolving. And there's even amazing research that shows that bumblebees will actually chew the leaves and the buds of plants to prompt them to flower. So where bumblebees are emerging before the flowers have had enough warmth or enough sunshine to actually come into bloom, the bees have evolved to trigger that response, to trigger that sort of panic and oh, I've got to blossom, I've got to reproduce. So we need to learn more from the bees and really think about our gardening, think about our, our planting and when we cut hedgerows, when we cut our lawns, all these things have a huge impact on the bees. Now, I've just had to make a decision, which I, I have never done before. A couple of weeks ago, one of my clients, um, the newt in Somerset, they had a wild swarm move into a tree hive. And it's a log hive that's attached to a tree made by Matt Somerville, a beautiful freedom hive. Now, it's very late for a swarm, July. And there's this wonderful old saying that a swarm in May is worth a bale of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. But a swarm in July isn't worth a fly, which basically means that the chances of them surviving through the winter are pretty bleak because what they've got to do through July and August is collect enough nectar to allow them to make enough wax comb that they can not only lay eggs to hatch in time to have a big enough colony to get through the winter, but they've also got to have enough room to collect the nectar and pollen to store to feed them through the winter. So it's quite a task. And the hive they'd moved into was a new one and it only had a tiny piece of wax in the top from a swarm that had passed through last year and had then moved into a tree hive. So we know that they've got a lot of work ahead of them. They are, however, in a woodland and near to some amazing gardens with lots of wild flower meadows. So they've got a good chance of getting lots of nectar and pollen. But the problem is that the nectar and pollen they'll collect now will be used to make the wax. And so when they come to store their honey for the winter, it's going to be mainly ivy honey, which crystallizes and is very difficult for the bees to digest in the winter months. So what I've done, which I really don't like doing, but I actually put in a patty of fondant, which is what um, can be fed to bees. So it's a sugar, but I actually got one with added um, herbs so that it will give them some extra nutrition. And I'm really pleased I did that now because just after we put it in, we had about three or four days of heavy rain. So that's three or four days that the bees could have been making wax and they couldn't leave the hive. Whereas now we know they had the food in there and they could make, make that wax. So although I have fed sugar, I wouldn't feed sugar to a colony that's already established because I'd always make sure that they've got enough of their own honey. And the honey has all the nutrition and all the goodness that the bees really want to keep them healthy. Sugar does not have the same nutritional values that they would get from having their um, honey. So this is why I think it's really important that we address how much honey we take from bees and really ensure that they have enough left in there. So I will be talking on my course, I'm doing um, a naturopathic beekeeping course and I will talk in detail then on how to extract honey, how to know just how much honey you should take from bees because every colony is different. So there's def various things that you can do to try and find out what you should be taking. So the nutrition in bees is really important. There's also studies that are uh, looking into the gut microbia of bees. And this I find amazing because humans, we now know that we need good gut mi microbia. 
And the whole making of honey is the bees are using their gut enzymes when they do this process called trophallaxis. When they've collected the nectar from the plants, they come back to the hive and they exchange it with another bee through the tongues. And the honey is going backwards and forwards between the bees, pulling up the gut enzymes, pulling, pulling up the good bacteria from each bee as they swap it along. And this is why when you buy honey, you want a raw honey, because it's that good bacteria, it's those good enzymes which make honey so magical and so medicinal for humans. So the moment you heat up a honey, you lose that good bacteria, you lose that goodness. So we really need to understand a bit more about the whole process of honey production, the whole process of making honey and being more aware. So if you're buying honey, you've got an idea of what's gone into it. I'm going to be doing a webinar in a couple of weeks time, which is just about honey. So everything you need to know about honey. So I'm just touching on it today. So the gut health, nutrition and bees, it's all really important for the bees. So last year I went to Canada and I was lucky enough to attend five days of lectures and there were some amazing speakers. And one of the keynote speakers was um, Gene Robinson. And he's been studying the receptors uh, affected by the neonicotin toys. Now, as I mentioned earlier about the receptors and the whole um, the nervous system and how the bees are just constantly bombarded with information. There was some more research in Frankfurt that showed that the, um, the neonicotin toids, they affect the bees nervous systems by blocking the receptors for the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And I really apologize for my pronunciation. So. What they then found was that there was a delay in larval development, which was caused by the behavioral disturbance of the nurse bee. So this means because the nurse bee was agitated, as I mentioned before, it meant that it took her longer to feed the larvae. So they weren't giving them the, the jelly that they needed, the altered jelly, and they were just taking a lot longer. They could, it would be taking 10 days to feed. So, they were finding there was irregular and so the eggs weren't developing quite as quickly. They, it just wasn't working in the same way. So it really was a problem. The other thing I found with the talks was that Jean Robinson was studying. They actually chipped every single bee in several colonies. So that took an age to start with. And they really loved the idea of, of observing how sociable bees were. So what were they doing when they're inside the hive? And how many interactions? So liking it to Facebook, they were saying, oh, well, every time a bee touched another bee, that classed as a like. And so they found that not surprisingly, the queen had the most likes. So she had the most interactions with different bees inside the hive. But then they noticed that there were some bees that were around the periphery of the hive who weren't interacting at all. They were just sort of standing around the outside of the hive just with no friends, no likes, not even posting anything. They were just doing nothing. So what was the purpose of this? So they kept studying and studying and looking at different types of hives. And then they managed to link it to the um, effect of being exposed to chemicals, it being exposed to the neonicotin toids and the fungicides. And this was affecting. So although some bees would become hyperactive, other bees would become withdrawn. Now, Bees are known to be social, social insects. So why would you have unsociable bees in there? Jean Robinson was also then thinking, well, could this be an environmental issue? So if bees were now exhibiting this kind of behavior, was it genetic? So they studied their DNA and it wasn't. So it wasn't something that these bees were born with. It was something that evolved. Now, then he looked at the comparison of humans and bees and humans and bees have been evolving separately for 600 million years. We came from we both both sort of family trees came from the flatworm 600 million years ago. So we've not connected since then. So how interesting is it that the DNA is not creating these unsociable bees? So could it be that DNA is not creating unsociable humans and the one thing that we have in common is our environment so it really makes us think about the impact of 
what we're living in, what sort of toxic soup are we inhaling? What are we eating? What are we putting into our bodies that is then having such an impact on behavior? So this is fascinating research and still needs to be ongoing. So we really need to think about what can we learn from bees? You'd think that bees are completely different and we'd have no comparisons whatsoever. And yet they're living in the same planet that we are. They're living on the same environment and they're getting sick and humans are sick too. So could there be some parallels between sick bees and sick humans? And this is something that I find not just interesting, but also very concerning. So I'm gonna talk a bit about bee sex. <laughs> so this is related as well to losses of bees. And I've mentioned how the queens and the drones aren't doing so well. And I've got this wonderful little clip, which I hope will show and it's from um, a film called More Than Honey. And it's one of the best pieces of footage of um, a queen mating in flight. So I hope you can see this. So there's the queen bee and the drones have to fly really fast. So it's the fittest, the strongest drones that catch the queen. They grab onto her abdomen. And then mate while they're in flight. And then as the drone falls away from the queen, he leaves his parts inside. During the mating ceremony, when the queen returns with her mating right, she keeps five million sperms in her sperm bag. In there, they can stay alive. So it's just amazing to think that the bees, they know how to mate, they know what they have to do. And there's so much that we can learn about drone congregation areas, which is where the drones go so that they know to find a passing queen. They have an idea of how they can find her. So one of the problems that bees are finding is that the drones are not mating. They're not mating as well. They're not producing the right quality sperm. And so the queens, although they're meant to have enough eggs, enough sperm inside their spermatheca to last them for up to five years, the queens are failing after a year they're running out of sperm, they're stopping laying, or they're just not even coming back. So there could be all kinds of issues going on. So it's always a risk when bees leave a hive, they can be taken by dragonflies, by birds, they could be attacked by wasps, hornets, there's all kinds of predators that are out there for the bees. But this year, particularly, I've noticed more queen failures than I'd ever noticed before. And I use local stock, so I'm not buying in queens. I'm just using from healthy bees that we've got in the area. And there's a lot of beekeepers as well, as well as the places where I keep my bees. And these, so there's a lot of natural swarming. We've got a lot of woodland. And so the bees should be healthy. We've got bees living in the wild and we've got bees that aren't treated. And yet we're having more and more queen failures. So it used to be blamed very much on Varroa but now as Varroa is, is more under control or more managed, either naturally or with chemicals, we're now having a problem with drones. So I was really interested and in the whole debate about to treat or not to treat against Varroa is really quite a contentious um, subject. Something that Joe Bleasdale, one of my bee team has always said, he's been treatment free for many, many years now and his bees have been used in research as well to find out how come he has such healthy bees with no Varroa or managing the Varroa. And he says, if you use a chemical treatment and one single mite survives, you've then produced a chemical resistant Varroa mite. And I think he's absolutely right. Unless you can kill every single one of them, they're gonna evolve. But the thing is to think about what parasites do and they look for a weak host. And this is what the varroa mite does. So by natural beekeeping, by allowing the bees to swarm, you're creating a brood break, which means that the 
there's no new larvae, no eggs, and so the varroa can't thrive in that kind of environment. But what really shocked me was when I was learning about beekeeping, I was told, oh, thymol is a really natural product. It's a, you know, it's thyme, it's thyme oil. And so how can that affect the bees? However, they have now found that it does have an impact. It does stop the bees, um, the drones from being as fertile. It affects the sperm production. It expects the longevity of the drones and of the queens. And the thing is, it may not kill them straight away, but it has an impact on the second and third generations. And this is what we can be seeing now is that you have a perfectly healthy hive or they look healthy, plenty of drones, good, healthy, strong queen. But when it comes to mating, something has happened that is affecting the quality. And so these drones are becoming sterile. So what can we do about that? And that is a real, real problem. I mean, a queen needs to mate with between five and 48 drones to provide her with enough sperm to get through her life and to give enough genetic diversity to make a colony sustainable. So if this isn't working, then what are we gonna do about it? And how can we fix that? So I was recently speaking in Holsworthy at a bee conference and after me was um, a researcher or professor, Steve Martin. And he has been studying the effects of chemicals in the hives. And along with all the natural beekeeping um, advocates, including Tom Seeley, Professor Tom Seeley, he's saying the chemicals don't work, but the bees, if they're left to their own devices, they seem to be able to evolve. They have hygienic behavior. They remove infected drones. They will uncap and recap larvae to make sure that it's clean you know, they they know how to protect themselves from this. And it's the weaker colonies that become overcome with, with Varroa and unhygienic behaviour by beekeepers, by transmitting the mites. So he was saying, we really need to think about stopping using chemicals. But he didn't advocate stopping straight away because you'll have a lot of colonies that would die. There's a lot of colonies that are being supported by the chemical use. And if you stop treating, you're going to die or the bees are going to die. So this is one of the dilemmas that when you're a beekeeper and you have one or three hives and you think, well, I'm going to go treatment free. And if you suddenly stop treating, you could lose all of those hives or you might lose two of them. And it's heartbreaking when you lose your bees. But we do need to look at the bigger picture. We need to look at the species as a whole. And what is the long term effect of every time you treat a hive? Every hive you treat, the drones from that hive are going out and they're not as fertile. So are you really saving the bees by treating them with chemicals or are you just making the situation worse? So what I've been doing is making sure that we don't use any chemicals. I've not used chemicals now for eight years. Many of my bee team don't use or haven't used chemicals for many years either. And the more I speak about chemicals in beehives, I have so many people coming to me and say, I've not used chemicals for years and I've got strong, healthy bees. So the bees know what they need to do. They know how to heal. And there are things that you can do to encourage the grooming. You can get bee gyms, which are these little plastic gadgets, which you can, if you've got hives that you can't get it into the bottom of the hive, you can put it by the outside, just by the, the entrance. And the bees will come out and clean themselves. They groom themselves on these gyms. And I've witnessed it. And I've witnessed it in outside worry hives where bees have come out and had a good old scratch on those. So maybe that's something to use so that you're not going, you're not stopping anything. You are actually helping the bees to do this. The other thing I've noticed, which I also heard during a lecture, is that when bees have filled all their honey stores and they're ready then for the winter, they can relax and they actually have time to practice grooming. And so if we take all the honey and leave an empty hive just with a block of sugar and or sugar syrup, then the bees are put into a state of stress and they don't have the time to practice the grooming. So this is a, another reason that if you have poorly hives, maybe just have a year where you don't take any honey or you just take a single frame instead of a whole super. So obviously this isn't gonna work for commercial beekeepers and we need to have discussions on how we can support commercial beekeepers to look after their bees. But I am hearing again from more and more 
honey producers all around the world who are trying different things, different ways, more natural ways, more ways in alignment with nature to give themselves strong, healthy hives. So it's the kind of thing we need to discuss and it needs to be open enough that people can share what they're doing without fear of being ridiculed or criticised. So we need an open discussion and we need to discuss with agriculture, with the big agrochemicals, with the farmers, with our local farmers, with gardeners, with everybody around us and what they're using so that we have an open conversation and think about our bees and our pollinators. Because I cannot believe that the damage with the fertility, with the nervous system, if that is affecting the insects that are feeding on the plants we're treating, which we're then going on and eating, does it really have no effect on us? And they've already shown that by combining the chemicals, it makes the chemicals more powerful. So just think of all the chemicals that we put. You know, if you're just eating food that has had the neonic is a treated seed. So perhaps you're having a non-organic sunflower oil. And so the oil is from the seeds of a plant that has been systemically treated. And you're having that oil every day and you're heating it up and you're you're eating that. But then you might be putting chemicals on your skin, on your hair, your soap, your shampoo. How many chemicals are we putting into our bodies? And what is the impact? What is the effect of that on our bodies and our health and well-being? So this is the kind of thing that I'd like us to be thinking about more. So the thymol and the mitocides, we do need to talk about them. So um, Burley et al. in 2008, they found that the sperm that was treated with cumafos was unviable. Now, cumafos is an organic phosphate. So neonics have had the bad rap for all this time about being the, the bee harming chemical. But actually, organophosphates also can be just as dangerous, if not worse. And this is one of the big fears that farmers have if they're not allowed to use the neonics and they go back to the worst chemicals, to the organophosphates. And in America, they use more of the organophosphates. In Europe, we use more of the um, neonics. Now, France has banned all the neonics. Europe has banned neonics. But what's going to happen in the UK? So these are the kind of things we need to be aware of is exactly how many chemicals are dangerous and what kind of impact they're having and what is that combination when it gets onto the bees and our food. So I've also talked about the thymol and oxalic acid and how it reduced the drone production and the survival. And so many drones were just getting lost. They weren't coming back to the hives. So this is, this is a real issue because the drones actually have magnetite in their abdomens, which draws them to the drone congregation areas which are ancient sites and they're magnetic pathways that the queen bee knows and they all get drawn to it ready for mating well if the drones can't find these spots and then they can't mate what is that saying so what is affecting the magnetic fields or the magnetic drawing that these insects have so there's so much more research that needs doing and we really need to look at our environment because it is our environment these are environmental issues they are not genetic issues so finally i'm going to talk about should we or shouldn't we be keeping bees now people often say oh i really want to save the bees so i want to get a hive and is that really the way that you're going to save the bees now this is a store of nucleus beehives in Canada that I saw and they're all cling wrapped and they're ready to go into a big deep freeze so that they can be kept at a, a frozen temperature or a very cool temperature to put the bees in torpor throughout the winter because in parts of Canada it's so cold that the bees um, well industrially kept bees like this wouldn't survive the winter so it's a way of of protecting them or saving the bees but this is a huge organization and they had huge great tankers outside full of sugar syrup to feed their bees to get them strong enough to get through the winter so this is real industrial beekeeping now if you are somebody who just wants to have one hive in your garden and you think that will save the bees the thing you need to think about is a colony of bees is 50,000 bees now that's 50,000 more hungry mouths that are going to need to feed in your garden and you've already got solitary bees and bumblebees who are living in your garden that perhaps you haven't noticed. And they're feeding off what you've got and they don't travel so far. 
So honeybees will travel three to five, three miles to five kilometers to get food. But the solitary bees and the bumblebees, many of which are the, the more efficient pollinators of our food, they can't travel that kind of distance. They will go up to a mile. So if you suddenly put 50,000 hungry bees in, who will go to the closest source of nectar and pollen? Are you then going to be starving the really important native pollinators? So before you think about having bees, think about what you're going to feed them. And if you really want to save the bees, you need to be making sure that they have enough food. And there are amazing projects going on all around the world where there's pollinator corridors and um, honey highways so that we're providing food for all the bees. And then that's the way that you can think of having honeybees. Also, if you're going to have honeybees, don't import them. Don't bring them from in from Italy or Greece. Actually use the native stock talk to local beekeepers, see if they have a nucleus or a swarm that they will let you have, or put an empty hive up and see if a swarm moves in. Then you are supporting the already existing native bees in your area, and you're going to have less of a damaging impact. So there is a momentum of change, thank goodness. Things I used to talk about seven, eight years ago, which were just shocking, and people couldn't believe that we shouldn't feed sugar or that we shouldn't treat chemicals. Um, treat our bees with chemicals for diseases. And now there's a huge movement. Professor Tom Seeley, the Natural Beekeeping Trust, Steve Martin, universities and um, research centres all around the world are saying we've got to look after our bees and we really need to be doing it in a more natural way. So have a look at some of these people and just have a think about the way forward, the way that we can be looking after our bees. So here's a beautiful natural swarm that I had in my garden. And I just love the way that it always makes a heart shape. There's just something so lovely about bees and so loving about the bees. So here's eight ways that you can be the change and help save the bees. So the first one, chemical free gardening. So stop using chemicals in your garden. Stop treating your lawn, stop spraying things, stop spraying your driveway, just think about the bees because every chemical you put in your garden it's going to kill a native pollinator or a honeybee plant more flowers and throughout the year so if the bees are flying in december there's something they can feed on and we do have plants that will flower there's hellebores rosemary all kinds of things snowdrops so try and have a garden that flowers throughout the year not just an amazing clump of lavender that flowers for a few short weeks during the summer. If you are going to keep bees, have chemical free beekeeping. Don't add to the problem by putting more chemicals inside your hive. Relish the dandelions and the brambles. If you've got dandelions in your lawn, just look at them and love them. If you've got brambles in your hedge, just think of all the wonderful bramble jelly, blackberries, you know, just love this free food change our perspective don't see them as weeds or as looking scruffy see it as amazing food for the bees and once the bees have pollinated it it's food for us too weeds and trees they feed the bees so we need our trees stop cutting down trees stop removing forests and woodland they need it the bees need it we need it too it's for all of our well well-being Buy honey from a local or sustainable beekeeper. So really start asking the questions, where do you get your honey from? If you're looking for a cheap honey, it probably isn't honey. It's gonna have been heated, it would have been shipped all around the world in big drums, mixed, and you're losing the magic of the plants that those bees have collected, have collected the nectar from. So always ask your beekeeper, Where's he got it from? Is he using chemicals? Because if there's chemicals in the hive, it gets residues are left in the wax. And although there's strict rules on when you use the chemicals, it's a good question to ask. And we really need to be thinking about what is in our honey. So and then treat your honey as medicine. It's really special. It is medicine. We know that Manuka honey is medicine. But that's just one of the few honeys that's actually been tested and proven. There are millions and millions of honey sources all around the world that local people and traditional um, cultures have used as medicine. 
without having it proven but they know from experience that honey is medicine in the quran it says it's medicine the bible talks about land of milk and honey so we know that there's this amazing magic magic that the bees produce from the flowers so let's treat it that way so don't waste it just take a tiny spoonful whenever you need it and feel the goodness that it does for your body and then probably the most important thing rather than keep bees just buy chemical free food because every time you buy food that is has had chemicals used to grow it you are contributing to that whole system to the whole chemical system so think about where your food comes from it doesn't have to be certified organic you can ask the farmer ask the grower ask the grocer ask the shop what chemical chemicals have been used on this food because if it's killing the insects what is it doing inside your body and if there's been research it would be really nice to know what the research found on people that are eating a lot of chemical treated food so I'm running a course, Naturopathic Beekeeping. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'm going to be doing one-to-one -one sessions or one-to-to -to the group sessions. I also have a one-to-one -one option. And I'm going to be talking about how you can get started. So everything you need to know. If you're thinking, well, I want to keep bees, but I don't want honey, or I want to keep bees and I do want honey, or I want to have propolis, or I want to work more with the bees, or um, I need to pollinate an orchard. I will help you with everything you need to know from what kind of hives, what the effects are on the bees for different hives, where you can place the hives in your garden and everything you need to know to take care of your bees so that you are a very um, caring but also responsible beekeeper. The moment you put bees into a box, you are responsible for their well-being. And it's really important that you understand about diseases and about health and how you can spot if your bees are getting sick so that you're not endangering other people's bees. So I'll be running this naturopathic beekeeping course. It goes over four weeks. Everything's going to be recorded. So if you're interested in it, just go to courses.paulacarnell.com and fill in your details and when you filled in your details you get to download a free ebook that I've written which is naturopathic beekeeping it's the principles of naturopathic beekeeping so you can understand where we're coming from and how we want to take care of our bees so there we go so thank you very much for um, staying with me for this presentation so the next one next week is going to be about propolis. So I'm going to talk about all the medicinal properties of propolis and how the bees produce it and how you can get it out of your hive. I don't know how to get it out of your clothes, though. Those beekeepers who have all the orange stains, that's the propolis. So um, but I'm going to talk about propolis. So if you're interested in finding out more, follow me on Instagram, Facebook. And um, yes, I'll see what I can do to help you. So I'm just going to have a look and see if we've got any comments. I've just got a couple of lovely hellos. So hello, Maggie, and hello, Esther. So if there's nothing else anybody wants to ask, then I will leave it for now. And I look forward to seeing you all next Friday at 4 p.m., same time, same place, and I'll be talking about propolis. And then if you go to webinar.paulacarnell.com, Dot com, you will see the whole program of my webinars and the different subjects. So there's going to be one about honey and then we have the one about propolis. So have a look at the program and I've picked subjects that are of interest to people. So thank you very much and have a great weekend. Enjoy the sunny weather and um, help us all save the bees. <laughs>